Hello and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I'm Lizzie Carr and I'm going to be talking to you today about all things paddle boarding, but not just any paddle boarding. I'm going to be talking to you about crossing the English Channel on a paddle board. I paddle boarded the English Channel back in 2018 and was the first female to solo complete that mission. It took me about seven hours to paddle board 24 miles and it was a great adventure but it was also full of lots of hairy moments and since we've been in lockdown I've been inundated with messages from people who are really interested in learning more about that journey and are thinking about doing it themselves so I thought I would be helpful and collate all of your questions in one place and create a video so you've got somewhere that you can go that answers all your questions about what it takes to cross the channel everything from how to train what permissions you need how to get a support crew any sort of scary moments that I encountered how did I make sure the weather was going to be okay there's lots of different variables that you'll have to think about and I've already done it so if I can give you some of my insight and knowledge then why not? So I've written out all of your questions here but before we dig into those I would say if you don't already it would be amazing if you could subscribe to my channel assuming you like my video and you enjoy watching my content um, or like, comment, interact with me, let me know that I'm doing okay and that you're getting answers to questions that you want. Anyway, let's crack on. Was your challenge sponsored? I think this is a really interesting place to start this conversation from because anyone watching this may be thinking that I did that challenge with huge financial backing from a big sponsor that came on board and helped me and the truth is that absolutely isn't the case. I self-funded the entire thing um, and I wanted to self-fund it because I was doing a lot of citizen science research out on the water and it was there was a bigger purpose to the adventure it was it was all about highlighting plastic pollution for me and I didn't want to have a brand get involved and then dilute that messaging or take control of what I was communicating and how I communicated it when what I was trying to say and what I was trying to get across was really important to me so everything you're about to hear in the rest of this video is based on me having to save up uh, beg, borrow, steal, I didn't steal, um, and just find my own way of making this happen um, when there wasn't really a blueprint in doing it. So I really hope this does, this does offer you some value based on my experiences and the mistakes that I've made and the learnings that I can take from it. Uh, but rest assured, if anyone is thinking of doing this, you can do it on a very small budget. And if it is a little bit too expensive for you, when you add up the cost of things like support boat and that kind of stuff, there's no reason why you can't find like-minded people that you can buddy up with and split costs. And I hope that maybe in the comments below, you'll be able to start those conversations with people and find people that are looking to do this journey and help sort of alleviate the financial burden that might be involved if it's too much for you. How did you train? I spent most of my time trying to replicate the conditions that I expected to experience out on the water so I did a lot of downwinders in the sea um, and then I would choose to go out in headwinds and crosswinds and generally more challenging conditions so that if I was faced with those I'd build up the stamina to deal with it. It's definitely all about packing in the miles. It's like doing a marathon. You know, if you're training for a marathon, you spend a lot of time just running and running and building that muscle memory. It's exactly the same when you're paddle boarding. So I can't really recommend enough just getting out on the water as much as possible and doing distance paddles, just really building up your, your strength in the right places. I also spent a day with um, a guy called Phil McCoy. I can put his details below. He's a paddleboarding racer and he just really helped me refining my technique so that I was able to do that distance and expend the least amount of energy whilst I was doing it. And I found that really helpful, just some little like tips and tricks to fine tune what I was doing and where I was potentially using energy that I didn't need to use. So if you're serious about doing it in a good time or you want to do it and be, you know, probably not exhausted by the end of it it may be worth speaking to Phil or other sort of trainers out there that can give you some really good advice to refine even just 
the way that you're putting your paddle in the water and, and doing your strokes or your stance just really simple things that you might not even be thinking about that you can just slightly adjust that it would make a big difference i should also mention that there was a lot of gym work involved a lot of strength training so people assume that paddle boarding uses a lot of arm strength and that's not really the case it does but it you're mostly firing from your butt from your from your glutes that they're your biggest sort of muscles in your body and um there's that's what you need to activate to get the most power in your strokes so definitely doing some gym work strength and conditioning work is really important to build you up for for long distance endurance as well how did you know the weather would be okay good question um i didn't and you can't really guarantee it being out on the english channel means accepting that there are changeable conditions that can come in quite unexpectedly. I waited three weeks, just over three weeks for a weather window and it was really frustrating because it was like a stop and start. I would literally get to the night before and I'm packed ready to go and I'm psyching myself up and I'm getting ready for it and then I'd get the call from the support crew telling me that actually we can't go out, the weather's not looking good, the winds aren't right, um, whatever, the tides aren't going to work for us. So had to be really aware of that and getting a support boat and support crew that are trained sea people is really helpful because you can discuss it with somebody and make a call together rather than sort of having that heavy decision sitting on your shoulders as to whether or not it's safe to to go out that day and try that challenge were you scared um was i scared um once i hit the water i actually felt fine because the pressure had built up before getting out there trying to get everything ready trying to get myself physically fit and mentally strong enough to do it and i actually struggled most with other people trying to give me advice and judging my ability based on their like, preconceptions of my paddling skills and I found that really tough because people that wouldn't necessarily know how I was as a paddleboarder or sort of even how determined I was mentally to complete that challenge would question whether or not I should be doing it, which then made me doubt myself. But the reality was that I trained hard enough, I'd had a lot of experience on the water already and I was competent enough to do it and I just needed that self-belief to get out there and and finish the job so I would say if people are offering advice particularly people that aren't paddle boarders and haven't crossed the English Channel themselves they are not in a position to tell you whether or not you're good enough ready capable that has to be down to you and your self-belief don't let anyone else make you question yourself because it's really unhelpful and you need to stay focused and you need to stay positive and believe that you can do what you set out to do and now I'm trying to think about whether there were specific moments when I was scared I was never really scared out there there were moments where I felt intimidated by the vastness of what was around me because it's effectively it's an abyss of blue blue sky blue water and there's no nothing to pinpoint yourself to in the distance you're just on your own in the middle of blue and that's really hard to adjust to mentally but that it didn't it didn't scare me it was just a very surreal new experience what was your favorite moment oh, where do i start there were so many great little memories that just flash back in my mind when i think about that challenge so when I started at Rye Harbour, I remember leaving the shoreline and feeling quite apprehensive about what lay ahead because it was the very start of it. And about a couple of miles offshore, I noticed these little um, porpoises just jumping in out of the water along my board. And they must have stayed with me for maybe three or four minutes. And it was just the most calming experience and i would never seen that before on my paddleboard on English waters that was brand new for me to see to see them and I took it as like a sign that they were like kind of looking after me and that I was safe because they were there and you may not believe in signs and that's completely fine but I found that incredibly reassuring and I think 
that's probably why I did feel safe and I didn't feel that scared because it was such a magical moment that I'd never had before and all the time I'd been out on the water I just felt like for me that was a good omen and then as I reached the end of the challenge and I got to the French shores a sea lion popped its head out of the water directly in front of my board like it jumped out my skin I screamed I didn't know what it was and I was a bit delirious by then um and again I'd never seen that before so I think for me all my favorite moments revolved around the wildlife that I encountered that I hadn't expected to see that just really made it quite special how long did it take you to finish took me just over seven hours so it's 24 miles in total and I think it was about seven hours 11 minutes was the final count to be honest I really wasn't doing it to set a record break a record and if you're going to go and beat that by all means I'm sure you'll be able to I'd stopped every fourth mile on that journey to do water sampling for microplastic pollution so that slowed me down a bit but also just being the first female to cross the channel was a really big achievement for me but beyond that doing the research that I was doing and getting the insight I was getting on plastic pollution meant so much more at the time that I really wasn't thinking about how fast I was going so if you do do it let me know your time I want to know how everyone else does did you wear a wetsuit funnily enough I didn't wear a wetsuit I really don't like wetsuits that much and when you're doing long distance even short distance but I find they really chafe under my arms just because of the paddling stroke that you're doing so I really try and avoid them I just love wearing really light breathable clothing I did wear neoprene leggings and I had a neoprene zip up so it was like I had a wetsuit but because it was two-piece I didn't have that same restriction in my movement and I didn't actually wear the top half. I was quite warm. It was early May when I went. The weather was okay, but um, it was warm enough and I was obviously hot because I was paddle boarding. And my, um, my, I wore a buoyancy aid and that kept me pretty toasty as well. So it depends what time of year you do it as to whether or not you should wear a wetsuit, I guess. Because if you're doing it in the middle of summer... I mean, you could go on a day and it's absolutely roasting out there and the last thing you want to be doing is sweltering in a boiling hot wetsuit, even a summer one. And you want the freedom of movement. Like, that's really important if you want to get power in your stroke and you are sort of trying to go for a time as well. How did you get the support boat and crew? Google is your best friend when you're planning an expedition. I think I just Googled charter companies that would take me across the channel and a few came up and I made a phone call, spoke to somebody, they loved the idea offered to help and I think I paid £1,800 for two crew members and the boat to support me there and bring me back. For a lot of people that would be a really prohibitive amount of money if it's not a sponsored expedition and that's why I think it's a really good idea if you are wanting to do this to comment below and maybe express your interest in doing it so other people can see that and you can buddy up, split costs. If you do that with four or five of you, you know, it's actually not that much, it's very achievable. I had to save for quite a long time to do that challenge, but I've obviously explained my reasons as to why I wanted to fund it. And then if you want things on top of that, like photographs, video, like all the, the things to capture your memories, that's going to cost more money if you're hiring somebody to do all that for you. I didn't, I couldn't afford any of it. I think my boy, well, my boyfriend just sat on the boat and took some pictures and that was it. Um, so yeah, do have a think about all the extra things that you might want that do cost money and ways that you can maybe get them. Like if friends want to come and sit on the support boat, I think I was allowed two or three people on there. So you could potentially get some friends to come out on a day trip to support you, but also capture some of the moments as well that, you, that you'd really like to keep. What board did you use? I crossed the channel on an inflatable red paddle board. I think it was an Explorer. In hindsight, as a more experienced paddler, I wouldn't pick that board now. I would go for a hard board because it cuts through the chop much better. The nose is much sharper. In my beginner's guide to paddling, I'd said about how I live in a pokey flat, so there's no room for big boards. And so it's all I'd ever been used to. And it was fine. It absolutely did the job. If you've got an inflatable and it's got, you know, a bit of a pointed nose, it's a, it's an explorer it's a, or a race board, 
you can do you can cross the channel by all means on that if you're going to be using more of a basic all-rounder board i'd really have a think about upgrading because you want something that if there is a bit of a chop and there will be that can cut through some of that chop did you need permissions i got another question that was quite similar to this asking whether you could cross the channel all in one go I'm going to answer both of these together because there's a lot of crossover in the answer. So ultimately, no, you don't need permission to cross the English Channel. However, there are some caveats to that. I let the Coast Guard know that I was leaving. I called them up a few days before and then the morning I was leaving, I told them where I was going from, who I was with, what I was wearing, um, and a few details that they that they asked for. I had a high frequency radio, the support boat had a high frequency radio and I had a tracker so I was visible on the on the marine navigation system. You're allowed to paddleboard on the shipping lanes on the English side but as soon as you hit French waters and you're in their shipping lanes you're not allowed to be on them in human powered craft which means anything like a canoe, a kayak, paddleboard. So I had to, at that point, get off my board, get onto the support boat, leave the shipping lane, which is about two and a half, three miles wide, get back on the water and then make up the distance to the other side. And that's why it's absolutely critical to have a support boat because you cannot be in those French waters, in those French shipping lanes, without somebody that will put you on their boat and take you off as quickly as possible. And they are on it. As soon as I hit French waters, someone radioed asking, who's the paddle boarder? am I on a boat, basically get out of their shipping lanes immediately. And we did, and it was fine. The Coast Guard then came and met us on the other side. So they were really strict about monitoring it and regulating it. So if you want to stay out of trouble, it is really worth doing. And please do, because it might be obvious, but more and more people are taking up paddle boarding now and doing lots of great adventures. And it's important that we act responsibly so that we can keep doing this great stuff otherwise if we don't it just means regulations get tightened or we don't get allowed to do them at all and that would be a real shame so please make sure that you do kind of abide by the rules that are set out for you when you're crossing the channel what's it like paddleboarding through the world's busiest shipping lane it's definitely an experience it's a bit intimidating when you kind of look over your shoulder and see a massive cargo ship and it's three miles in the distance so you know it must be ginormous if it actually gets close to you and it's just about making sure that as you're crossing through the channel and they're coming along it that you are not in that pathway because you're going a lot slower than these but these vessels these boats they're going fast and you don't realize it because obviously they're sort of coming from a distance so it's important that you're really communicative with your support crew at that point. And another reason why A, you need a tracker and B, you need to have a support crew because they will help you decide sort of when the moment is to speed up and paddle your ass off or hold back and wait and let the boats pass. I remember very distinctly one moment, probably goes back to that question about were you scared because I was a little bit here. The boat captain radioed me and was just said, Lizzie, you need to paddle hard for 10 minutes now and I was like oh shit and I was paddling and paddling paddling and I was sort of looking and it was it was actually really foggy that day that's something that had come in that we weren't expecting it was quite extreme fog for a small section and just out of nowhere this huge cargo vessel was coming towards me it wasn't close it was within a perfectly reasonable distance but because it was so foggy it just appeared and um, and that was quite quite a moment but generally, if you time that right, there's no problems. I had nothing, there was nothing in my journey when I crossed the shipping lane that made me worry, but that's because we were really careful with how it was judged. So that is pretty much all of your questions answered now. There's just one more to go. Would you do it again? Yeah. Yeah, I think I would. If I did it again, I'd want to do it with other people. I'd want to make it more of an adventure and enjoy it and share it with people on the water with me. It really is an incredible thing to do. To know that you started the morning in one country, went on a paddling adventure that took you all the way to the shores of another country. 
yeah it makes me really like nostalgic and it's such happy memories when I think about it so I would like to do it again but I would like to do it with some teammates if you're looking anyway I think that's it if you have any more questions pop them below I'll do my best to answer them and anything I've mentioned in the way of kit uh, boat crew equipment in this video I will link to below as additional resource for you as I'm sure it'll be helpful and that's it thank you very much and if you do go on your paddling adventure let me know how you get on yes.